Hello and welcome to today's webinar, ECM Makeover, Modernizing Your Dated System. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are Alan Pell Sharp from Deep Analysis and George Parapadakis from Alfresco. Alfresco is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. I want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar, and while I do that, I just have a little bit of information about AIM up on the screen for you. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of your screen is the list of all the widgets that we have available for you today. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list, and that's to the right of the slide area. There are also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's on the left side of your screen. We will hold these questions until the end, where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. But you can also use this feature to comment or ask for technical assistance. At the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open up in your browser, and I value your feedback greatly, and I'd appreciate it if you'd take a few minutes to complete the survey, to, uh, to give your feedback, and to suggest other topics for us to cover. You can also access the survey in the list of widgets across the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a couple of days. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Very pleased to have both of these gentlemen with us. Alan Pell Sharp is CEO and founder of Deep Analysis. And Alan has over 25 years of experience in the IT industry, working with a wide variety of end user organizations and suppliers around the world. Alan was formerly a partner at the Real Story Group, consulting director at Indian services firm Wipro, and vice president for North America at the industry analyst firm Ovum. He is regu regularly quoted in the press, including the Wall Street Journal and The Guardian, and has appeared on the BBC, CNBC, and ABC as an expert guest. We also have with us today George Parapadakis, and he's the Business Solutions Strategy Director in EMEA for Alfresco. George is passionate about understanding business problems and converting them to business opportunities using information technology. He enjoys translating technology solutions to business value. For 30 years, he's designed and coded software solutions, taught them, and written and blogged about them. He's built strategies and roadmaps and developed new markets for clients and for vendors. George has his AIM CIP certification, and just this past week, he was inducted into AIM's very esteemed Company of Fellows for his contribution to our industry. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Alan to begin our discussion today. Alan? Thanks very much, Teresa. So today we're going to be looking at the hidden cost of doing nothing. Um, and uh, I say that slightly tongue-in-cheek because, as you'll see, we're going to try and keep this as practical as we possibly can so that you can go away, I hope, with uh, something that you can use within your organization. But what we find a lot of the time is that uh, ECM, um, content management, process management, whatever you're involved in, um, but uh, basically that tricky task of uh, managing the process of information throughout your organization can just be overwhelming. And many years of investments and strategies and ideas um, have culminated in something of a spider's web or uh, whatever analogy you want to use, but a mess by any other term and people don't really know where to start and sort of that's the idea of this is to, to sort of help you and uh, I guess also let you know that you're not alone here you know other people um, are struggling with the same things well my company deep analysis is a new analyst firm as Teresa says I've been around the block a few times in this industry and I'm very very fortunate that uh, through my career as an analyst and uh, an advisor I guess is that I only typically get called in to help, um, if help is the, the, the right word here, when things go wrong. Uh, if everything's wonderful and shiny, um, they have no use for me. Um, so I get to see um, and hopefully help where things have been a challenge. And what I've found over the years is that so often it's the same challenges. 
And so often people are finding themselves in situations that were, well, were, were avoidable um, had they known that others had shared uh, similar experiences. So that's what I want to do today is focus in and give you some practical tips, some fact-based analysis. So I'm using that term. It's sort of, uh, again, slightly tongue-in-cheek if you follow the, uh, the politics uh, in the U.S., uh, where I am based, despite my accent. So fact-based analysis. So what does that actually mean? Well, let's just try and put some context around this. Well, I'm not going to spend time on my sort of uh, sales slide here, but uh, I, I hope anyway at least that uh, what I provide for you today and what George will provide for you is, is focused in um, with some very practical information and uh, is, is honest and open with you, actually. That's a really important thing. We're going to sort of share the goods and the bads today, but the real world. So, I mean, I've brought up two actual real examples from um, my career past, and there are so many others. Um, but, uh, you know, these are sort of, I guess you might say somewhat extreme, but the principles of the problems these people face are, are very common. So a major U.S. Uh, hospital network, uh, my company, when I was at Real Story Group, we worked with them and uh, we identified over 5,000 silos of information. And when I say over 5,000, we stopped counting when we got to 5,000. Um, who knows how many there really were? Um, and it sounds like a crazy amount, but it's it's amazing, um, particularly, you know, tools, um, many of the tools that are available today, people can just build another repository just by clicking a few buttons and there's another silo. The big thing you find, though, in, in many of these situations is that there is no overall plan and, and often there's actually conflicting plans, conflicting policies, conflicting regulatory requirements. Uh, duplicate processes, etc. And that's not because they, they, they wanted it that way, obviously, but it's really because the technology has just, just rushed at people so fast over the last 20 plus years that um, it's just sort of happened. But we're at that point now, I believe, in our industry where it really is time to take a step back and say, well, we just can't continue this way. And, um, you know, is, is there a better way forward? So a few formal processes, just an enormous amount of information. And not that hospital, but in a conversation I had just this week, in fact, um, with a, a, a systems integrator, they were telling me about a small project they're working on in a hospital where um, they're basically trying to put some control around uh, radiography uh, files and they found 50 different silos of radiography files within this one hospital. So again, you know, multiple silos. Um, and I want to pick up on, a, on really one of the key themes here. Content that's, when we use that word silo, it doesn't sound like it's active. It doesn't sound like anything interesting is happening. It, we're really talking about storage. And, you know, my sort of tagline for deep analysis, and uh, I wish I'd copywritten it because other people want to use it now, is content plus process equals transformation. Without some kind of process, without some kind of activity connected to your content, that's what you have. You have a silo. You have a dumping ground, which is what the this big uh, European bank, uh, one you would all know, um, you know, multiple terabytes, in fact, actually getting to the petabyte level um, and very closely controlled. I mean, this is a highly regulated sector. They, you know, they've got money. They're not daft. They know what they're doing up to a point when it comes to information. So very closely controlled, but all of these silos separately controlled, differently controlled. They've popped up in different divisions of the organization and it's become a regulatory nightmare. And I think, you know, regulation, not that it's an area you really want to go into too much today, but, you know, everybody's affected by regulations today, whether that's, um, you know, privacy and, uh, and uh, you know, identifiable information or whether it's just certain local regulations regarding you as a local authority or as a pharmaceuticals firm or, or whatever. Everybody has some sort of uh, regulatory environment. And most people, I'm going to be bold here and say, Certainly most of the organizations I've worked with over the years, um, not due to a lack of diligence or, or seriousness, but they're not actually in regulatory compliance with a lot of things because they don't know how to. It's just they're overwhelmed. And so you end up with these mountains of dark data, which is a nice way of saying junk, right? 
Well, this European bank, uh, last count at least, was nine figures, pounds, by the way, not dollars, per annum, just to sustain this situation. Um, now, you probably, and I hope, I sincerely hope you're not spending nine figures a year just to, uh, just to keep the status quo, but people are spending substantial amounts of money on maintenance fees, on on a lot of things, actually. Um, but, you know, the, the costs mount up, and we could go into that again in, in more detail maybe at a future date, but the costs do mount up really quickly, and that's the cost of doing nothing. That information is not of use to anybody. Um, you don't want to get rid of it because you're not sure, and you don't want to get in trouble, so you just keep paying and piling it up. So content plus process equals digital transformation. Um, yeah, it's my tagline, but I think it's a good one for everybody to just go and take away, maybe make it your own, maybe change it somewhat. But at the end of the day, really the starting point for a makeover or a rethink is that word process. What is this content, this information, this data doing? What process or set of processes is it related to? I mean, you need to be asking those kind of questions. And that's a great place to start. And in many cases, you'll find out, actually, the content is not. So we've immediately got to a point where we can basically start saying, look, if we've got static content, if we've got stuff that isn't doing anything, why are we? What's the cost and what's the risk of that? And you know, as the bullet points say here, and I'm not going to, we've got quite a lot of bullet points coming up and I don't want to just simply read, read them out to you, but maybe just to get this, this rolling here, you know, you do need to start thinking about process. What, what is our company actually doing? Now, it doesn't matter whether you're private sector or public sector, what is it we're actually trying to achieve? And if you're spending good money on systems and, uh, you know, silos, as we keep calling them, um, that are not contributing to that, then that's an opportunity, right? So value comes from contextualizing the, the data. If you've got information and you can apply a process to it, or at least say, well, it should be applied to this process here, then maybe, um, you know, you start to understand the value of it a little bit better. So again, you need both content and process to respond to the disruptors and market challenges. And that's the, the, that phrase there, disruptors and market challenges. I think we've all um, sort of watched all the changes that's been happening over the many years with social and Google and whatever examples, and Uber seems to be the one that everybody uh, re references these days. But regardless of the change going on around us, this change that is going to impact us directly, the cost of a lot of these um, tools, uh, has dropped, as we know, but that hasn't actually reduced the complexity. And people are coming along and disrupting, both at the technology and at the process level. New startups, I mean, like mine, frankly, you know, I am able, as a small company, to get a CRM system up and running in no time, something which was unthinkable 10 years ago. So there are market challenges and disruptors coming along to uh, shake us all up, frankly. So anyway, the purpose of this first slide was really just to say, start thinking about process, start thinking about how your organization operates, start mapping that in some way to what you currently have. So it's a good idea, frankly, to, to do a bit of a count as we did for that hospital. Um, you know, you don't have to go to, uh, to that level of detail, but just start mapping out the why, the what, the when, and the how, right? Why should I change, right? And the reason you should change most likely, we'll go into this in a bit more depth, obviously, but the reason you should change probably is because you could save a lot of money and get some efficiencies quite quickly. And I'm going to stress that quite quickly. A lot of people don't really know where to start. And I think that is one of the things I come across the most in my work. And I'm going to bring George in in a second here. Because I think, uh, you know, from my discussions with George, it's something he also encounters quite a lot, that you find people who just are stuck with the status quo. They have outdated, expensive technology. They're paying high maintenance fees on it. They've got disconnected uh, information. Nothing's connected much to a process. And they want to move forward, but they really just don't know how. So, I mean, George, is that something we want to talk about a little bit more here? How do people actually get started? And I think the how, which obviously 
proceeds the why, but uh, you, you need the why. What's, what's the sort of driving issues do you see beyond sort of just reducing costs for people? Sure. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending when you are. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that we, we regularly talk to customers about, and the, they, come, they come at it from different directions. Some of them come at it purely from a cost perspective. We, we, we understand that we have got a system in place. We don't feel we're getting the value out of it. We feel that maintenance costs are going up year on year, and we feel we need to do something different with it to reduce the costs. Some of them come from a different perspective, which is uh, we don't feel we're getting any value. We need to connect this information, this content to different processes, different operations, and uh, just the sheer cost and effort and time involved in IT projects, being able to integrate that information to where we need it to be integrated is just too high. So it, it becomes a stumbling block and it becomes a, um, a non-starter project for a lot of the people because they just can't get the budgets and the timeline that they need to be able to move forward. Yeah, and I think that's it. I mean, a lot of it, if we're just being real and honest with people here, a lot of it is cost, right? A lot of it is cost. They want to save money. They want to uh, work more efficiently. And in our industry, we, we're very good at coming up with, with terminology and acronyms and stuff, but probably the flavor of the last year or so has been uh, transformation. And I think too many organizations think that that's grand and exciting and wonderful if you're, you're, you've got tons of money and you can throw consultants at it. But I'm a big believer that um, actually you can transform by going almost like the other way, which to that last bullet point there, uh, an old shaker quote, uh, simplify, simplify, simplify. I've always found that that's one of the best ways to get started. What don't you need anymore, right? What is redundant? And if you start targeting that, it's surprising because by what happens is by targeting those dead sort of, you know, whether that's a mountain of old SharePoint uh, sites or, or repositories that you're no longer accessing, whether that's uh, file servers that are still running. Um, uh, another real example from uh, somebody I was talking to the past week, um, you know, somebody has actually got a bunch of ViewStar and Wang repositories still running in a large organization. Stuff like that, it sounds dull, it is dull, but what happens is when you focus in on that redundancy, it shines a light by default on the stuff that's really critical. And I find that's often a way you can sort of get a good starting point within the organization by saying, look, if we get rid of this stuff, we can really focus in here. We can focus our resources in here. So that sort of brings us to the, to the what, right? And this really is essentially almost a checklist, I would say, of how I certainly and many others go around advising people, find out what and where your silos are. Uh, you know, it might be five or ten, it might be hundreds, who knows, but find them out. That's not an expensive job. That's something that's just going to take a little bit of time. And uh, just by doing that, you're starting now to map out what, you know, us business process people would call the as-is situation. It's very difficult to really know where you want to be in the future. That That could change, but you really do need to know where you're currently at. And it seems so incredibly obvious to say that. But I will tell you, hand on heart, that very, very few of my clients over the years have actually had much idea of their current situation. And I always, always advise them to just do, you know, a, it could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a Word document, pen and paper. I don't care. But get a list of what silos you have, what's in them, if you're able to do that, where they are, and then just start that process of prioritization. What actually works today? Do you have something that is a real shining example? Everybody loves it. It's great. It's fantastic. Find out what works. And of course, at the same time, find out what doesn't work, right? You know, what's just sitting there running up costs or what's what's 
which which systems have you have you implemented that people are just finding workarounds to workarounds are really interesting if your if your users if i can call it that or your customers are not utilizing the system they're doing something else you know rather than just trying to shut them down find out why because they may well have found a better way of working so acknowledge and identify the change agents and the blockers you know some people are going to be supportive some people are not this again may seem like uh, you know motherhood and apple pie or whatever the phrase is but blockers most big projects that i have seen that go awry some way somewhere down the line is because they didn't acknowledge the real objections they didn't bring those people into the conversation early on you can't fix everybody you can't make everybody happy all of the time but just acknowledging um, you know the change agents within your organization those who are supportive and maybe the many more people who are not supportive get that conversation going and start to assign ownership so if you have silos if you have broken processes who owns those silos who owns those processes the truth is probably nobody officially today but that's a great opportunity and again just it's it's like a very dark room where one light has gone on in the corner and more lights start switching on as we go through and uh, so very practical here um, maybe a little obvious but I can tell you and it's a phrase I use way too often and I should stop it but you know I know this is all common sense but the fact is common sense isn't actually all that common um, these are these five bullet points here are what I see almost every single time to some degree or other in an ECM related or business process related project that hasn't gone well or a firm where basically they're they're at a, a you know a red light they don't know how to move forward George is there anything else that we should have maybe had on that slide that you've seen uh, not something else I just want to expand on something you mentioned uh, the, the idea of the mm -hmm. blockers kind of fascinates me mm -hmm. because it, it kind of takes the what to what for so so I'm thinking we've got quite a few um, customers that I spoke to in the last year particularly who are looking to change completely the way they focus on information so let's take mm -hmm. an insurance for example where you have different departments with different products and all their information tends to be uh, siloed and, and centered around the offerings they have. So now they're looking to change around and put the their customers and their users in the center of the design. So applying design thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, they get you to a point where they're starting to, to change the purpose of how they hold that information and looking at it from the outside in to say, how can we bring that information together from the customer's perspective, so they don't have to go to three, four different parts of our website to find out different policies based on what products we bought, but they can look at their portfolio in one place and get all the information in one go. So I, I think it's an extension to the what in terms of what information we have. It's also what for, what is the purpose of that information, yes. understanding uh, you know, what value does it have to the organization and at the end of the day to, to the customers and the users. I think that's that's you, you make a great point, uh, George. And I, you know the the way I've phrased this in the past, it's a bit sort of consulting speak. So I apologise in advance, but you know what is your story, right? So uh, for some people, it's just cost reduction. They're just looking at eye-watering bills coming in uh, for maintenance fees on systems that aren't being used, and and that's a very real uh, you know problem for people to fix. But as you say, for other people, it's you know their business is transforming. Um, and uh, people are changing their approaches and they are becoming more customer centric and so maybe that's their story you know actually aligning this sort of the information and the processes in, in a way that they haven't in the past um, or in a better way perhaps and for others it, it is it's a regulatory discussion um, when we're, we're not in compliance and we need to get in compliance um, everybody's got a different story and so you know what and where are your silos what works today what doesn't work today acknowledge the the supporters and the blockers assign ownership all great stuff but I think yeah absolutely I think we could just label right over that also figure out what your story is and that touches on something uh, I published the other week I'm not going to go into it here but 
you know, the point is with ECM, right? It is, it's, it's a set of technologies and uh, one size does not fit all. And, uh, you know, your, your needs are going to have um, things in general with other people so you can learn from them, but it's got to be crafted to meet your specific needs. So again, don't just go out there and um, assume that you can buy yet more technology, slap it into place and everything will be fixed because it's never worked that way in the past and uh, probably isn't going to in the future. I think uh, as we're getting on to the when, prioritize. I mean, it, I came up uh, many years ago, and if I can dig it out and share it with uh, anybody who's interested, I will do. Um, but uh, it was a thing called a prioritization matrix, uh, which was just a grand term, frankly, for essentially a Boston square, if you like the magic quadrant type square that said, you know, look, okay, we're overwhelmed. There's too many things going on in this project. We can't do all of this this quickly, or it, we can't get everything done in one go. Okay, let's just figure out, okay, how important is it? And how difficult will it be to fix? You get the balance of those two, and you suddenly start to, you know, prioritizing things. But at the same time, I know we've said this a couple of times, but it's worth worth repeating. If your content is static, if it's just sitting in a repository doing nothing, um, that that's probably telling you something right there. And I've been a big advocate of the the big bucket approach over the years, and um, which has put me basically um, in a position of conflict, shall I say, with many traditional records managers who believe that, uh, and quite rightly, I understand their position, that things should be very finely uh, managed. I just figure that, you know what, people are at the point where they can't manage anything today. So simple metrics. And you can just ask questions. Now, these questions will be specific to you. You've got to come up with your own, essentially. But if something, if a piece of content has never been accessed once in the last five years, why is it still sitting in an expensive system? Now, maybe you can simply get rid of it. Maybe you move it to the cheapest possible storage that you, you, you can find. But it shouldn't be sitting in a live, expensive ECM system. It, that's, there's no logic there. So apply some, think up some metrics of your own. You know, maybe that five years becomes 10 years for you. I don't know, but um, defining what's active and what's static is a, is a fantastic and simple step to do right at the beginning of your project. And then again, you know, is this process critical? Well, you know, I guess if it's part of your business, it's got some criticality to it. But, you know, to George's point before, some things are way more important than others. Maybe your company is going through some or you're, you know, if you're in the public sector, actually, I have to find there's more transformation going on there um, where there's, you know, pressure to uh, to change and uh, to uh, put things on online and to, you know, go paperless, all of these things which have been around for years but seem to have picked up a bit of pace recently. Is this process really critical? Is this one we can put on the back burner or is this one we want to deal with now? And, you know, again, always find a quick win if you can. If you've got a great big project that's going to be running for the next six months or the next three years, you will be a, a, a rock star if you find a quick win. Something simple, something visible show that you've actually created some kind of change. It doesn't matter how rudimentary. People like winners. And again, I know it sounds simple, but find a quick win, something that actually matters to your company, something you can change. Don't worry so much about the overall uh, you know, future strategy, but make sure that whatever you're doing is actually related to uh, you, you know where your company's moving, where your organization is moving. So, I think that that brings up this whole thing, which, and I'm going to pass to you, George, a little bit on this because process, right? We've I've talked here a lot about linking content to process, but maybe I'm wrong. But from my perspective, I've often seen ECM projects not really grasp the reality that all ECM projects are also business process projects. Is that fair? Absolutely, and and it's not it's not a question of whether they are part of a process. There is a process transformation around documents and around content, but there is no content that exists inside an organization that doesn't get either created or used or associated with 
a core business process. Otherwise, you wouldn't have it. It wouldn't be part of your organization. So uh, the reality is you need, to, you need to understand, even if you don't connect process and content at a technical level, you need to totally understand what processes the content relates to. And, and the question on the when uh, is always now or, you know, the day before yesterday. I haven't, yeah. I haven't come across any customer who, who is willing to entertain an 18-month IT project anymore to create yeah. change internally. So the, 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 the when also almost becomes a moot point is how soon can we have it? How quickly can we pivot? How quickly can we adapt to market changes? I think that's, yes, absolutely. And uh, just before we move on to the next slide, uh, something you said there just rang a bell in my ear. And it's that um, something I have done for 20 years now. The first thing, so if, you, if you're an organization that for whatever reason one day works with me, you, you've, you've been given a tip here. The first thing I will ask for on the first day of uh, any kind of engagement is, can I see the flow charts? It's a loaded question because I sort of know there aren't any. But I really do want to stress right from the get-go, do you understand how the information flows in your organization? And, uh, you know, it, again, not a bad thing to do and really easy. You know, you, you can get Gliffy for free on Chrome and start doing a few flow charts. But, it, again, um, when, I think George makes a great point, those long projects do exist today, but the, they typically weren't planned that way. Um, it's all very agile and quick wins, and uh, everybody wants everything yesterday. But again, it's really hard to get started. And um, and I think often what happens is people bite off too big a chunk to begin with. That's just my observation. So into the how. How to make changes happen. Um, already said this, I know, but start simple, right? some visible quick wins and iterates. And it comes back to what George was just saying there, the sort of big, oh, you know, I'm a contractor, let me get in there and I'll, I'll sort of embed myself for the next two or three years. We'd like to think that's, that's not the way we work today. And it isn't the way we plan to work today. It does sometimes work out that way, though, unfortunately, because there wasn't much planning and strategy in the first place. And it wasn't broken into digestible bites. But do make the changes measurable. And this is an area, and I'd be really interested in George's feedback on this one, but this is one I've battled with over the years. I am totally incompetent when it comes to mathematics. Uh, I, I am not a counter. Um, I'm one of those people who struggled with it throughout school. And yet here I am over the years telling people, make things, make changes measurable. And people will say to me, well, how do you do that? You can't measure this or that. Yes, you can. And frankly, I'll go as far as to say, if you can't measure it, you need to be questioning whether you should be doing it. There is a book out there. I think you can get it on Amazon. I believe it's still in print. It's called How to Measure Anything, and I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, to the more practical sort of technology things here, yeah, avoid technology lock-in. You, you really... I mean, if you want to lock yourself into a single vendor, that's your choice. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll make that choice and you'll go with it anyway. But, you know, the reality is technology today is so different from, from where it started 20, you know, in, in our industry at least, 20, 25 years ago. It is less proprietary. It is more open. Um, there is still a lot of proprietary things out there that are being sold. And you do need to seriously question um, whether that's the route you want to take. Because if you look at where people are with their multiple silos that full of static content, a lot of that actually is to do with the fact that they bought something proprietary and it's now really expensive, um, or they perceive it to be really expensive to move or to integrate. And, and that's an unnecessary burden you're putting yourself on if you're buying or selecting technology today. Um, you know, Obviously, we're working with Alfresco today, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but uh, the, the fact is, you know, do, do be open to possibilities of different technologies that might fix the same problem. Um, you don't need to have, uh, and I'm saying this um, respectfully, but you, you don't have to have the people who are in the top right of what, whichever Gartner Magic Quadrant. There may be multiple pieces of technology that, that would do uh, fix the problem in different ways, but fix them equally well. So keep keep yourself open both to um, 
uh, choice and avoiding lock-in. And this one, I mean, this just seems like the most obvious bullet point we've had so far, but don't create yet more silos. And this is what we've seen, you know, when SharePoint came along, for example, um, it frankly created a lot more silos. It did a lot of good things too, but it, it, it created more silos. File sync and share vendors, um, you know, are by default sort of creating yet more silos. So be cognizant of that. Try to avoid that. You're never going to get everything in one place. That's not real. Um, but just do think about that when you're you're moving forward. Um, certainly what I find is when new um, Technologies for managing information and processes come along, they seldom actually replace whatever came before them. They usually don't replace them at all. It's just another another system you're you're now supporting. So yeah, reinvent. Yeah. Think think creatively. Um some of those old things actually maybe they're not worth ripping and replacing. You know, maybe maybe you might just want to keep up with them. Maybe you do just want to connect to them in some way. Be, you know, be open to reinventing rather than actually replacing because ripping and replacing your current environment may not, probably isn't, in fact, um, a true reality right now. And, um, you know, George, you were talking about this earlier about, uh, you know, agility and how projects have changed um, from those sort of, you know, massive sort of multi-year things to um, much more agile, bite-sized pieces. But, I'm, I'm wondering, is there, are there some lessons there or, or some observation you have there about how that can sometimes um, catch people out without them having sort of, you know, a proper understanding? I'm setting you up here, obviously, but if they haven't sort <laughs> of uh, done a proper as is and got a proper grasp on what they're up to and they start doing these things, can they make the situation even worse? Um, uh, yeah, they can. It actually brings two of the points you made together. You, you talked about making changes measurable. And I think that ties in very well with the uh, with the agility because mm. at the end of the day, the users themselves don't necessarily know what they want and how they're going to get it. So being able to have small iterative cycles, applying well applying agile development principles but over the whole project to say try things, test them out, measure them, sit down with the users, understand how they use systems, how they use information. How does the information flow? Uh, and that makes measurable uh, something that can be achieved. So I, you know, I've, worked, I've worked with users who wouldn't be able to draw you a flow of the whole process because they don't have visibility of the whole process. But if you sit down with them next to their desk for a couple of hours when they're taking calls and answering customer requests and looking at what they're doing on screen, how are they using the system, what um, workarounds and tools they have, you know, laminated sheets with dates instead of being able to calculate things online, which cost time, they cost mind, they cost effort, and they cost frustration. So all of these become measurable. Now, fixing one or two or three things at a time and iterating makes it much, much easier to put some sort of ROI and benefits calculation around these changes. Uh, if you're trying to measure an ROI or do a business value assessment study over a whole transformation project, it's a major consulting exercise and, and not many people can afford to do that. But you can look at practicalities of, of the daily life of the users and the, what they're struggling with, and then it becomes quite yeah. tangible. I, th I You know, that's that really sings to me, be and I'll... I'll, I'll share a, a real anecdote uh, in the I worked with a pensions co company a, a few years ago and uh, they brought me in just to sort of oversee and be an independent sort of third eye if you like uh, as to what they were doing and they presented uh, what they were doing and and they showed me the current process and I remember leaving them it was a four and a half hour drive by the way and I drove home and something bugged me all the way and when I got home I realized what it was I was thinking well damn it if if, if that's what they're doing now, why do they want to change? That looked really good. And I literally drove back at my own cost the next day and sat with some of their users who told me, yeah, right, that's the process. I don't think so. And they started showing me how their real world was. And you know what? That project just turned on a dime. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems, again, like so much of this advice we're sharing today, so obvious, but 
do involve the users from the get-go. And to pull it back to a previous point when I, we talked about engaging the blockers, right, getting, talking to those blockers, very often the blockers are the current users of the current system. And the reason they're blocking you is they don't think you understand what they do, and they may well be right. So try and recruit them early on because those blockers can become your champions and they can really help move things forward. And it, that actually happens a lot. So um, sort of getting to the end here, I guess, for our, our sort of uh, speaking discussion bit. But um, so summarizing up, um, figure out the as is, right? Do spend some time doing that. And when I say spend some time, we're not talking about a three month consulting project. It could be an afternoon, for goodness sake, but do spend some time figuring out what you actually have. And as we've put it here, why? Yeah, why it is. What is that content? What is it supposed to be doing? Yeah, prioritize. You can't do everything at once. You are going to be living with some aging systems, most likely, for a long time to come. You can't rip and replace at, at, at will. So figure out what's really important, what's important to the organization. Think in terms of information flows. Don't think in terms of documents. Don't think in terms of, somebody uh, used a phrase the other day, which I loved, a document is just another form of uh, you know, data storage, essentially, right? So think in terms of what it does, the information flows. And uh, do, so we've, we've said here all the way through, you know, be open, be agile, do all of this. But at the end of the day, some stuff probably does need to be enforced. There are some processes which, you know, you, you just have to do and be, be aware of which ones they are and where they are early on in your sort of planning. And you may have to put the foot down there. You want to limit that, obviously, and keep things open and free and agile, but do consider enforcing some behaviors at the very least. Build for agility. I think George talked to this really well. Agility, openness, future change. We used to talk about the as is and the to be, where do we want to be? It's still a good conversation to have, but the truth is things are just changing at such a pace. We're, we're not really all that sure where we want to be, um, but we can build a, a flexible foundation today um, much more easily than we ever could to manage future change. Um, simplify, 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 keep it simple, keep it simple. Small, quick wins are always the way to go prioritized quick wins are a goal to uh, achieve and uh, to aim for, but keep it simple. And yes, this last bullet point is absolutely self-serving. I will be the first to say it, but get expert advice. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yes, your story is going to be different to the next person's, but you know, a lot of the underlying um, foundations, the building blocks, People have been there before. They've hit the same roadblocks. They've hit, hit the same pr problem. You don't have to. You can bring in some expert, expert advice. Yeah, I'd love it if it was me, but you know, there's lots of experts out there who can help you. And maybe those experts come from a community of practice or something where you know you can go and talk to peers. But get get expert advice from outside before you really dive in. There's just so much shared knowledge available and uh, expertise. Don't reinvent the wheel for the second time. Right? Don't reinvent the wheel third time. Not necessary anymore. But that's really pretty much the end of, of my time. And we've, we've sort of tried to keep this uh, at a quick pace. Um, I hope this has been of some value. We've kept it really sort of simple and practical. Um, I do hope we can continue the conversation. That's my email address. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, obviously uh, working with AIM and their resources uh, is a good way to go. I'll be out uh, to speak at the um, AIM UK forum, I believe is its proper title in June. If any of you are going to be there, I'd love to meet you in person and, um, and uh, see if we can uh, move this, this industry and this practice forward together. And with that, I'll pass over to you, George. Thanks, Alan. Um, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for keeping an interesting discussion and always practical guidelines, which, which is why I love talking to you uh, and having these conversations over the years. Um, I, there's contact points there. Obviously, you know, I'm sitting now on the vendor side and I represent Alfresco, but something that, that uh, Alan just said triggered a thought. Uh, you'll find expertise in the market in a lot of different places. 
just because people are on the vendor side doesn't mean they haven't been consultants before. It doesn't mean they haven't delivered projects. Someone on the consulting side will have a lot of expertise, potentially from uh, having been on the vendor and understanding the product development cycle. So um, some of these boundaries that we have within our industry are fairly artificial. Uh, a lot of us have long careers around content management and process management. So uh, use advice whenever it's available. Um, part of my role, for example, in, inside of Fresco is to help customers just understand what they can do with the technology. It's not pushing them to, to um, adopt the technology, to buy anything. It's just getting them to understand the value that they can get uh, from where they are. So, so use that expertise wherever it's available. So just I wanted to thank uh, Alan and, and hand over to um, Teresa. Just before that, um, I just wanted to bring to you an attention of, to, to uh, a white paper that we have worked with AIM to pull together. Uh, that covers a lot of the point we talked about today around the cost of standing still. What, what are reasons that people in the market are looking to, to innovate and renovate the, the legacy content management systems and bringing process into the uh, mix? So um, with that, I'll hand over to Teresa. Well, thank you. And, and there is a link up here on the screen for you, but also it is uh, this paper is listed in the resources section that's to the right side of your of the slide area. And just click on any or all of those uh, links in the resources, and it's just going to open up in a new browser tab for you. It's not going to shut out the webinar. Um, so do that, and then after the webinar, you can download the papers and and uh, and just read through them. Um, this cost of standing still it uh, was written by a, another analyst, a, a, one of AIM's newest analysts, uh, Thomas Lamont. So it, it gives a, a yet a slightly different perspective, but still really good, valuable information in here. And so um, I do encourage you to do to read this one. And, and also, um, George, we're sharing another paper that um, that Alfresco has is talking about the digital flow. Um, can you just mention real briefly what's in that paper and why that would so important yes. to share with our audience? Uh, absolutely. So, so this is a, a short uh, ebook that uh, John Newton, who's founder of uh, Documentum and founder of Alfresco, has put together with some. some uh, very advanced thoughts on, on how the information management uh, technologies change inside organizations. And he's talking about information flow, uh, digital flow, how information flows across boundaries inside the organization, across silos and across processes. But it also introduces three uh, different thinking approaches to uh, tackling this project. So it's talking about design thinking, putting the uh, user in the center of the design and the customer in the center of the design. Talks about the principles of open thinking, how um, open architectures, uh, open standards, and open technologies are, are transforming the way um, content technologies interoperate inside the organization. And it's also talking about pl platform thinking. And this is not so much platform in the sense of uh, content management platforms, uh, or process management platforms, is talking about how organizations themselves are transforming uh, to become digital platforms and to share their capabilities um, in, in reusable components out with the, the wider market. So it, it's a very interesting uh, book and it's a very interesting uh, read in terms of understanding where the market is going as a whole. So I, I would thoroughly recommend you to uh, have a read through that. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me when I was listening to the two of you speak when, when you were um, talking about metrics and making the changes measurable, and it's something that I've heard um, other end users say on how they made it successful and w was to make those changes and have those metrics be directly in line with the senior executive's objectives for that quarter that uh, for the organization. Um, because there's a way, because they were talking about the way of keeping it for having the, the, the senior champions keeping involved with the project so that it doesn't get derailed from from that level. Because um, there's so many challenges with, with working through this um, for keeping the, the the senior stakeholders involved is to uh, directly map that to company objectives. It is, and, and I gather that's something that you frequently see that 
might be missing from plans? I, yeah, definitely, Teresa. I mean, it's it's a little bit like if you're looking for a job and you're pulling a CV together. Um, you know, if if you're serious, you're probably adapting and changing your CV and your cover letter for every job, right? No, not always practical, I know, but that's sort of the best practice. It's the same thing here, you know, where your department is at um, is one thing, but uh, just there's some good wordsmithing. I, I don't want to get people uh, to be dishonest here, but some good wordsmithing that aligns the changes you want to make with where your board or your senior management want to go can go a long way. And um, they don't really, I mean, the, the fact is, you know, when people put business cases together um, and it goes up the chain, it, it often goes to people who are so disconnected from that work that they just don't get it, right? So, yeah, I think it goes a long way to to make an effort to align your personal, your departments, your divisions, requirements with some sort of, uh, uh, you know, overarching business uh, strategy or mission that, that the company has. And like much of the advice that we've been given here, it, it seems obvious, but it really doesn't actually happen very often. Um, and just uh, just a few word changes or, or an extra paragraph can go a long way, really can go a long way to uh, getting some buy-in. And I think that's a very valid point um, that you made, Teresa. And also, if you look at it from a practicality perspective, change doesn't happen without investment. And if you want to justify investment in your organization, the best way possible to do that is to be able to articulate how that change you're making in, in our little microcosm of information management affects the bottom line, affects the, the, the stakeholder values. So being able to join the dots from the changes you are making or you're planning to make in your project to how it affects the company as a whole uh, makes a huge difference, not only in terms of whether you get the budget for it, but also if you can sustain the project. We've seen, and Alan can attest to that as well, we've seen endless projects that have started and ended nowhere in particular because other things took priority. You know, the, the, the large ERP implementation, the, the the big marketing transformation that is happening, uh, and suddenly the project that you care and love and have put effort in becomes secondary. Now, if we can articulate that value and tie back to the company, uh, the company goals, the company vision, then you've got more of a chance of being able to sustain that project through to the end. Um, I have a question that's come in from the audience members, and, and Alan, I'll go ahead and mm -hmm. start with you on this. Sure. Um, someone's asking for some detailed tips and tricks um, mm -hmm. for a company where they're producing, and if I'm re reading this correctly, where not only do they have the documents that are you know in progress in their intranet, but they're also using paper instructions, paper documents. Right. Can you talk a little bit about common, that? Absolutely. That I mean, that you know is a common problem, and we. You know, obviously, the vendors and the analysts love to talk about all the exciting, sexy new technology. But the fact is, you know, many, many, many organizations are still heavily dependent on paper. That's uh, that has not changed at the pace anybody thought it would. We're a long way from the paperless office. Um, I, you know, obviously, I don't know this uh, this company's particular um, ins and outs, but I, let me answer that sort of maybe from give some tips and tricks uh, from two angles. Um, and I'll just relate them to real world. When I started out, long before I was an analyst, I was a document controller in oil and gas, and I just remember I could not, there was a time I just could not get the attention of the project manager, who the project manager was sort of you know, God on this uh, big oil and gas thing. Could not get his attention. I kept telling him I wanted to change things, and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just changed my tack one day, and I went and said to him, I just caught him in the corridor, I said, you, you know we spend 150,000 pounds a year on printing. Um, you know, through the print rooms and everything. I said, I think I can get that down to 25,000. Literally, two minutes later, I'm sat in his office talking to him. So, you know, I got his attention. So, you know, at one end of it is paper ain't cheap. It's surprisingly expensive. At the other end, though, and I think possibly this is where more where the person is coming from, I can give you a, a great example of, of a change I saw in an organization where, you know, they had invested heavily in, uh, yeah, I'll call it an intranet. I mean, this was a really pretty sophisticated thing, highly regulated organization, very structured. 
And what was happening was, um, you know, production workers, if I can call them that, um, were just literally printing stuff out and, uh, and you know, using paper instructions and often the wrong ones. And it was a real problem. And you know how they, they fixed it? They moved to iPads. Um, they just moved to iPads, and it was the craziest thing. I mean, these were restricted iPads. There was a lot of discussion internally that people were going to use them for their own personal things, and people would run off with them. Well, yeah, okay. Well, you know, what, what, you know, what does some kind of tablet cost these days? 90 pounds? So just factor in that some of them are going to walk out the company. But uh, people love those, and you'd be surprised, you'd be surprised when the, those hit the production floor and people just start flicking through the pages. Um, they love them. The difference is, of course, you've probably reduced costs, and more importantly, maybe um, they're now actually accessing the right documents. So, you know, do it sounds simple. Um, a lot of this stuff is. I know we keep keep saying that, but um, yeah, tablets. Tablets uh, in manufacturing, in production, in healthcare, um, are the use of them is growing at an incredible pace, and the purpose of them is to get people away from those paper instructions. But uh, you've got more chance, I would say, of getting them to use a, uh, a tablet than uh, logging into the internet. Thank you. Um, well, we're getting to the end of our webinar hour, and I just want to remind everyone that we have been recording the webinar, and it will be available in the next day or two at AIM.org's resources webinar page. Um, just want to remind everyone to download the resources um, that are to the right of the slide area. And also, when the webinar is over, a brief survey is going to open up on your desktop, and I would greatly appreciate it if you take the time to complete that survey and offer um, and suggest other topics we can cover. I also want to thank our underwriter, Alfresco. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you with these free educational programs like our webinar. So thank you, Alfresco, for your sponsorship. And just wanted to mention to everyone that, uh, as you may or may not be aware, AIM offers a variety of different types and, and uh, of, of different training, um, online, in person, um, a few one-hour classes, week-long types, uh, uh, time commitment kind of thing, but it's a variety of um, really good training on a variety of different um, ECM process improvement, um, uh, electronic records management type of training, and, and I've attended a number of them uh, personally, so they've been very helpful in learning and understanding, but certainly being in there with the other students, as, as Alan has mentioned, just being able to talk with other practitioners, just to get ideas and, and to have that community. This is uh, one way also to, to have that. So check out the, the training information that we do have available on the AIM website. So just as we are at the end here, I do want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thoughts or a key takeaway. And I'd like to start first with um, George Parapadakis of Alfresco, your closing thoughts today. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you to AIM and thank you to Alan and thank you to everybody who, who joined the, uh, the webinar. Um, secondly, I just want to say that uh, it, we're really entering a new era in, in terms of content management. We, we, we're no longer just creating repositories for people to dump their files in and, and share with each other. We, we do need to support those basic document management use cases, but it goes all the way to an extreme opposite end where large companies like FINRA and Cisco and GE were looking to, to create content and use it intelligently to be able to drive things like fraud analytics or uh, uh, process automation at large scale on massive cloud uh, deployments on AWS, for example. So they're looking for, a, for content architectures that would allow them to sustain that, that move and uh, they're looking to be able to do it fast. They need tooling to be able to do that. So I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, this, is, this is a very different place where ECM was perhaps three years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm quite privileged and excited to, to, to continue to be at the forefront of ECM with that as digital business services are starting to support that change and that move. So thank you. Thanks, George. And Alan Pell Sharp from Deep Analysis, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, well, my closing thoughts, I guess, uh, sort of pick up on George's a little bit. I mean, at a technology level, yeah, we're in a really different place. And, uh, you know, the industry uh, is talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning and intelligent process and all of those great things. 
But let's, let's just remember, those aren't actually going to replace information and document and processes they're going to enhance so there's great opportunities out there but we still have to manage information um, it's not going to do it by itself and uh, you know probably the theme of this is that a lot of people I mean certainly that I encounter really are struggling to know where to start um, you know the question uh, that we answered there about paper look the reality is there's a lot of old systems there's a lot of paper out there and it can seem overwhelming and it can seem daunting, but the, re the fact is you, ca you can start. You can start now and you can start practically and you can start without investing a fortune and get the ball rolling. And uh, I think these are great times for our industry. Um, if you'd asked me that a few years ago, I might have had a bit more of a negative uh, response saying, oh, I don't know if it's going anywhere. But the fact is um, it's really taking off. And for the technology vendors, that's great. Of course it is. But you know it's a great time to be in this profession. Um, there is a need that is so great and unmet for trained information management professionals, people who can really make a difference out there. And that need's only going to grow. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of it. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you next time. And have a great day. <laughs>